so let's get started. Um, so today is last day of just thinking about like pure, simple linear regression. So it's like a little bit, no more coffee. Um, it's obviously not true that we're going to stop working on linear regression. We're going to continue to do linear regression for much of the things we'll address, but we're going to take a little detour um, away from them for the next couple of weeks. So today is kind of our last day of thinking about this. And what we're going to be talking about is kind of penalized linear regressions. And, um, you know, what is, I think, not unreasonable is, well, this is almost not fair. So we're going to be talking about penalized regression. So really, the big thing we'll focus on is lasso, but there'll be a number of things we'll be talking about. Um, you know, there's always this joke. This is, you know, lasso is definitely a type of machine learning. Um, now there's a lot more fancy ways of doing machine learning. And so lasso is not kind of the cutting edge or, you know, these regularized models more generally are not the quote unquote cutting edge. The, the fact of the matter is like, you know, OLS is also machine learning. There's lots of ways to think about machine learning. So I'm going to kind of use interchangeably these terms at like machine learning or ML when I'm talking about lasso and these other regularized estimators. The reason we're talking about them today is because we're going to be focusing on the idea of using types of models that you're approximating using linear functions and you're gonna put penalties on them. There are gonna be other types of machine learning models that do different types of approaches for estimating functions. Um, there are gonna be good reasons why people focus on these linear models that use penalization. Um, but you know, the idea is, think of this as we're kind of doing, this is an initial preview for later in the class, we're gonna be thinking about ML methods in a general sense as well. But um, we're going to really focus on the linear models and specifically we're going to focus on linear models that use penalization to really select or shrink the relevant right hand side variables. So the right hand side variables, I mean like the covariates of interest. So we're going to focus on lasso um, we're going to focus a lot on lasso for reasons that will be kind of clear by the end. Um, in this least absolute shrinkage and selection operator, which so you'd think since it's an acronym, it should be capitalized, but then nobody capitalizes it. So I won't be capitalizing it. Um, this is coined, coined by Rob uh, Tipshiriani in 1996, although apparently there's a, a longer historical um, aspect to this. And, you know, the key concept underlying these methods that is valuable um, is this idea of model selection. Um, so this is this idea that what we'll get is we'll be able to kind of know which variables matter for our regression and others will be not important. Um, typically, this isn't a great topic for causal inference. Um, you know, we've kind of already talked about that you can't, you know, the, the question of causal inference is almost in some ways not something that you can guide based on data. We don't know what variables affect what and kind of looking at the observed data, there's many reasons why that might not reflect um, causal properties. We're gonna talk about how they can be useful at the kind of the end of class, because um, there are gonna be some circumstances for causal inference where it can be really valuable. So what's the big idea? So the big idea is that there are many circumstances where we have a problem like the following. So many variables, sometimes too many, and by too many, I mean like we have more variables than we have observations that we'd like to use as regressors. We'd like to put them on the right-hand side because we think they're predictive or they soak up variation or something else. Or, so that's that's setting number one. Or we have an unknown and potentially complicated function of many variables. So, you know, the two simple examples. So imagine we have some data Y and covariates X. We have these, these data X has some dimension P and we're thinking about, okay, well, there could be a linear model where it's yi equals xi zero beta zero, where this xi, the true model, is some subset of the covariates. But unfortunately, you don't know which variables in your data um, are the right ones, right? So this is as simple as saying, like, look, I can throw 100 things on the right-hand side. Really, we think only 10 of them are predictive. How do I know which ones are the right one? So some beta K are gonna be zero, right? It's like a model selection problem. You're saying like, I don't know which ones are the right ones. Um, this can be matter. This could matter. The alternative way of setting up kind of a similar problem 
is to say, look, y is a function of x, and we want to approximate f as best we can. And for example, so this is almost related to what we did with bin scatter, right? When we were thinking about semi-parametric functions, we were like, look, we want to approximate it. We can approximate it with functions. That was easy to think about when you were thinking about f and of x being a, a univariate, right? Like a univariate function, it's pretty straightforward to approximate that in the sense that you're like, okay, you know, I'll add powers of x until I can get a good approximation to it. It becomes the problem starts to blow up, as you can imagine, once you allow x to have higher dimensions. So if x has dimension five, all of a sudden there's so many different interactions and powers that it becomes very challenging to estimate that and approximate it. And so you don't want to just fully saturate the model and allow for all interactions and do all powers, uh, like a lot of high powers of x. Instead, you kind of want to put those in and then figure out which are the most important. So the idea is that hopefully, and this is what's going to come up later, is we're going to really just assume the idea that there is some sparse set of variables that matter. So either P0 is small, so the number of covariates that we have is small, or that F can be approximated by some small number of variables, some small number of combinations of X. Is that clear so far to people? Okay. So what's Lasso doing? So Lasso is doing the following. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to ignore any issues of endogeneity. So we're assuming X's are what they are. We're kind of just interested in, in fitting these linear models and to keep things linear. So we're not going to do this F approximation. We're just thinking about the, there are sets of covariates that we want to know, um, we want to put on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking about there being a true model, which we pre-specified that is only a subset of them are true. So this is an irrelevant number of right-hand side variables. So an example in which this shows up is people think of this in like genetics, people are really interested in this question is the idea that we think there are certain genes that cause certain, um, certain phenotypes. And so then there's a lot of regressions with a lot of right-hand side things and they'd like to pick the few that matter. Um, not for economic, this is not like uh, genetics and economics, but like actually in biology. This comes up a lot in biostatistics. So what you'd like to do, for example, we might care is like, we want to know what are the true right ones for the purpose of interpretation. Now, what's interesting is as our data sets grows, right? So one aspect of OLS is kind of nice is if P stays fixed, OLS is eventually going to figure out which ones, which betas are zeros. Right in the sense that OLS has these nice properties, we know all the pro all the coefficients are necessarily going to converge to zero in the limit as we get more and more data if their true parameter is zero. But the problem is it's not an immediate fact that they're going to be zero. Only in the limit do the quote unquote, like the wrong estimates, the ones that are supposed to be zero, converge to actual zero. So in any data set that we observe, they're going to be non-negative. We won't actually know which one are non-zero, and we won't actually know which ones are uh, supposed to be zero and which ones are not. There are tests you could try and do, and you could try and do model selection in that way, but it's not a thing that comes out immediately from OLS. And worse yet is that if the variables are correlated or noisy, it's going to, if you start putting everything in on the right-hand side, you're gonna basically have a, a really poorly fit model. Parsimony is really valuable for say running OLS. The more things you put on the right-hand side, it can really create issues for the variables you're interested in, especially when things are collinear. So in finite samples, what we'd love, and this is a problem people worked on for a while, that selects the right variables and fits the outcome well. So this is kind of two things going on simultaneously. It's a model selection problem. So it's saying, how do I know which coefficients are relevant? And then it's also a regularization problem. So Kim, this is to kind of the point is regularization in the sense of how do I make the model fit better by kind of controlling the noisiness of the coefficients. So Lasso um, was proposed by Tip Shiriani in this, um, in this article from 1996, where he proposed this penalization method for doing um, both things simultaneously. So what he said was, this is a way that you can potentially identify the non-zero covariates and shrink the estimates accordingly. So 
just to give you a uh, sense of what they're doing. So the top line is the objective function for OLS, right? So OLS is pretty straightforward. Um, OLS is saying minimize the sum of squared errors, right? We already saw that. We talked about that last class. So that's great. That's easy. Um, Lasso, in contrast, is minimizing the sum of squared errors subject to a constraint. So this is a way of writing the lasso problem. Really, you can write it in multiple ways. This is the what's called the Lagrangian way of writing it. So if you wrote it, another way you could say it is minimize the sum of the squared errors like in OLS, but penalize the sum of the beta k's have to be less than some value. Um, right, this is like a budget constraint. It's a budget constraint for your coefficients. So really Lasso just added a thresholding penalty where Lambda is what's called a tuning parameter chosen by the researcher. So since we don't want things to get big, so that's a very vague statement, but really it means like we don't want the sum of squared errors to get big and we don't want the coefficients to get big in Lasso. Lasso is gonna push coefficient values down um, in order to keep the second penalization term from blowing up. And so that's going to regularize the parameter values. And what it's going to do is because it's an absolute value, so I, I forgot to mention this, but this is an absolute value. This is what's called the L1 norm for people who don't know this. So when you do absolute value, that's an L1 norm. When you square something, that's called an L2 norm. Um, actually, for purposes of this, let me just restate it because I, I don't know if I ever explained this. Um, but if you take something and you say, like, so you have a, well, let me think of the easiest way to do this. So if I take some value, beta k, and I put in a one here, I put it in this norm, I'm saying effectively take the absolute value. That's basic, I mean, there's more there, but the, the way to think about this is that this is saying take the absolute value. If I put a squared, if I take the L2 norm, what I'm doing is I'm squaring, I'm squaring this, and that's we're getting back into um, OLS territory. So there's the point is that there's terms in between in the middle. So you could this is you can call something an LP norm, and then you could have P up here, and P can range. So there's um, examples where P could be zero, and then what you're doing is you're taking like the maximum. This is what sometimes um, this is basically just doing a different kind of metric um, over a space. And then there's things like fractional norms. Anyway, those are complicated and frankly, totally irrelevant for what we're interested in. But it's worth knowing in case you see these terms and you don't, I don't want you to get confused. Really the norms that are relevant are the L2 norm, which is squaring things, the L1 norm, which is absolute value, and then everything else, which is, means that somebody's doing something really complicated. So that's like the world you should live in. There's three things, two of them are relevant. The third one, you're gonna to have to spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, so what the L1 norm is going to do, and I'll show you a picture in just a second of why this is the case, but the L1 norm is gonna actually push coefficients to zero, like all the way down to zero, rather than um, just a little bit. So the reason for this is basically is that if it's worth, if you think about the gradient of the subjective function when you're moving around these betas is if it's worth decreasing beta k slightly, basically it continues to be worthwhile all the way until you hit zero. So there's basically this gradient that unlike in, if you did like an L2 norm on the beta k, so if this term here um, was an L2 norm, that, that would be called ridge regression. What'll happen then is that you'll reduce beta k slightly and then all of a sudden it won't be the like basically the cost of a higher beta k won't be that high. And so then it'll switch and start moving around other values. In this one, the value, basically the shadow cost of reducing a beta k is stays the same. And so you keep pushing that one down all the way until you hit a corner solution. If that's not an intuitive way of thinking about it for you, you can look at the, graphically, it's kind of the way that I prefer to do it. What you can think about it is that if you think about the first term in the minimization. So this is this minimizing least squared errors. You can write that down as the difference between the beta that I'm choosing, the difference of that away from the OLS one. You're basically minimizing this. So obviously this would be minimized at, so there should be, this is basically this term plus a constant. So if you pick beta equal to beta OLS, this will be minimized because we know that OLS is the minimizes the sum of squared errors, right? So that's hopefully clear to everyone. Remember OLS, great, 
it does this really good job. It's the best linear predictor. And so it gets as close as possible as you can. So the beta that you pick here when you're doing this first term in the minimization for lasso, well, as you get closer and closer to beta, that's going to be getting you less and less of this term. It's a squared term. And so the way to think about this is that here is um, this picture on the right. These concentric circles here are isoquant values of this minimization for any fixed value of beta around beta OLS. So the way to think about this is that this beta hat here, that's the OLS value. If we pick that, then we'd be minimum, that would be the best linear predictor, it would be OLS. And if you go out, you get basically larger minimization terms. And then these black things, so in A, this is lasso, that's the constraint defined by lambda. So it, this is this axis, sorry, I should have defined the axis. The axis is the value of beta one and the axis, this other one is beta two. So you, it's, a, it's a two covariate regression. I have two terms. And so obviously subject to my Lambda constraint that this constraint here is remember that I have some value and I wanna keep the sum of them as, li as low as possible. So, I, this is my constraint. I need to hit my budget constraint. And so then the what the lasso regression is going to do is it's going to find the concentric circles around OLS that coincide with the budget constraint. The key trick behind this is that effectively, it's almost always, it's going to end up tending to push things to zero. Now, it won't always, but because of basically the angular nature of the budget constraint, and you can do this in three dimensions. If you look at the Tib Shiriani paper in three dimensions, you'll see a version of this, is that because of these um, L1 norms, what you're going to get is you're going to get coefficients that are going to be shrunk all the way to zero. So in this example, the beta, beta 1 is shrunk to zero, and everything is on beta 2. Is that clear to everybody? Okay. In contrast, just as I mentioned before, remember how there's this L2 norm you can do on the penalty? Well, in that case, you would have this kind of much smoother um, budget constraint that comes from the L2 norm. And then as a consequence, you wouldn't have shrunk them all the way to zero. You'd actually get um, them just shrunk towards zero. Okay. So what's so great? about lasso. So a quick aside on mean squared errors, if you don't aren't familiar with this, this is sort of helpful. Lasso and basically modified versions of lasso is that they're very efficient estimators. They do a good job of predicting why well. And the other nice part about it is that they pick a, a subset of, sorry, this should say subset of covariate, lots of typos today. Um, pick a subset of covariates, making the model interpretation easier. So, you know, what's really nice, right? I mean, it's sort of hard to emphasize this enough, but you'll see it if you do it yourself. It's like, if you run a regression with a hundred things, it's very challenging to interpret the coefficients when you put in lots of potential right-hand side variables. If it then only picks three things for you, that makes it a lot easier to talk about, well, which ones are the most important for predicting my outcome? Okay, so, you know, this first point about it being very efficient and predicting why, well, that's something worth kind of commenting on. So why is that the case? So these regularized estimators, generally speaking, so lasso, ridge regression, any of these ML estimators, is that what they're doing is they're trying to minimize the mean squared error. They're trying to do a good job of minimizing mean squared error and especially for these prediction problems. And the thing to remember about this, if you haven't seen this before, um, this is really kind of the crucial thing that um, economists like to emphasize is that Remember the mean squared error of an estimator, you can always write as the variance of the estimator plus the bias of the estimator squared. So the insight of understanding these regularized estimators is always to say, historically, when we talk about OLS and other estimators, we've cared a lot about the bias being small or going to zero in the limit, right? This is something like we talked about like, we said, oh, OLS is blue. If, if any of you took your first econometrics class, they were like, OLS is great because it's unbiased. 
And you're like, okay, well, this term is zero. And so then it's all about just can give it conditional on finding a, a low bias estimator, can we minimize the variance? And so that's what it means to have the most efficient estimator, for example. Now we've opened a new can of worms by allowing ourselves to be in this regularized world, right? We said, all right, forget about this no bias problem. Let's let, give ourselves a little bit of bias. At, at the, and the trade-off is going to be that we'll reduce variance substantially, right? So that's what if we were willing to allow ourselves to be a little bit biased such that we could substantially reduce the variance? That's what almost all these regularized estimators are doing. Um, and a nice feature of Lasso is it has a lower mean squared error than OLS in a lot of cases. But the problem, of course, is that these terms can be biased. And this is true just generally of a lot of, well, basically any machine learning application. So one kind of very magical property of Lasso is what's called the Oracle property. Um, and we're going to get into this because I think it's really relevant for understanding what's going on with these machine learning estimators and kind of what's happened uh, more generally in the space. So one really interesting property of Lasso and really derivative approaches. So this paper we're going to talk about, it's called adaptive Lasso, which is very, very similar, um, is that it has something called the Oracle property. So let's read this. This is from Zoo, um, 2006 in JASA. So this is from the very beginning. Um, so what he says is, let us consider model estimation and variable selection in linear regression models. Assume that there's some Y which is, and then some X, which we have um, these orthogonal uh, predictors. And that we have some matrix and then there's some true model, right? There's these beta, beta star. Um, so they're getting rid of the intercept. That's easy. And then so A, script A, is the set of non-zero coefficients. And that, that set of non-zero coefficients is some subset. And then finally, um, have some beta hat. So this beta hat is like the lasso approach. They talk about, he talks about, the Oracle procedure is one that if beta hat of some property, so adaptive lasso in this paper or lasso more generally, has the following, is an Oracle procedure if it has the following properties. It identifies the right subset model asymptotically. So let n go to infinity, so some asymptotic approximation. You're always going to figure it out. You're always going to know what A is. So for a big enough sample, you're always going to know what A is, no matter what. And there are asymptotically normally distributed where the terms are basically the covariance matrix from just estimating on the true model. So basically in essence, we get the right model and we get asymptotic normality, which maybe for all of you, it's like first time seeing this since so you don't, it's like the reaction should be, wow, this seems way too good to be true. I mean, effectively what I'm telling you is with a big enough sample and you run Lasso or some version of it, you can always figure out kind of what are the true predictors and what are the ones that you should um, be ignoring. Any questions on this? Okay. So this is too good to be true. Um, Fortunately, I'm going to sort of tell you how it's too good to be true. And then I'm going to tell you how it essentially has been rescued to some extent um, in recent years by um, a kind of newer literature that's changed the, changed the rules or changed the objective. So let me do an aside here so that we can kind of make sure everyone's on the same page for when they see why, why, um, why it's too good to be true. So I'm going to say this out loud because I think this is worth, I really like struggled to care or like remember, I sort of, you sort of get this beat into you. And so you have, you should feel totally free to not remember what this stuff is. But when we learn our asymptotic results about estimators in our econometrics classes, we learn about pointwise and uniform convergence of our estimators. 
So a key thing most of the time when you're trying to prove certain properties like the asymptotic normality of the estimators you're interested in is we prove, prove point-wise convergence and then we talk about uniform convergence of these estimators. So that's where we're, we're going to briefly talk about why that matters, why that distinction matters. So the, the reason is, is that remember that all of our asymptotic results are about approximations to finite samples. So remember the whole idea behind penalized and ML methods is we're trying to improve finite sample performance. Really OLS only does well when you have like an infeasibly infinite amount of data. That's like the case in which it always necessarily does well. Um, it's, it can do quite poorly in finite samples under certain settings. So the kind of the trick is, is that what you, what you want to remember is that we can think about the pointwise convergence of an estimator as being that the true S for given a true estimate, given the true value of something, we can consider the convergence of that estimator for, to that estimate, right? So estimate theta zero, we talk about the convergence of theta hat to that estimate. But that is basically holding fixed the value of theta zero. Almost always when we do our estimators and we talk about the distributional properties, we want uniform convergence. Basically that this convergence is done simultaneously across all values of theta zero um, in that you get this convergence. So why I was doing that preamble at the beginning is like, you're like, why, so who cares? Well, the thing is, and then what it matters as you get more and more into this work is that the uniform convergence really matters for our asymptotic approximations to do a good job at approximating things in finite samples. Basically, we don't know what theta zero is a lot of the time, and we want it to do a reasonably good job. And with uniform convergence, what it basically says is that much of the time we're kind of going to do a reasonable job irrespective of kind of where theta zero is in the space. It's kind of a smooth amount. We can't do infinitely badly in any one place. That's what uniform convergence kind of guarantees for us. Well, with regards to Lasso and the Oracle property, um, Lieb and Potcher have this paper. This is in the Journal of Econometrics in 2008. Um, and you know, this is the closest to a dunking that happens in econometrics, which is effectively that what they say is we show that the sparsity of an estimator leads to undesirable risk properties of that estimator. So what does that mean? That risk properties here means like how badly can you do given like given an estimator, how badly can you do in terms of how, how far you are from the estimate? The result is set in the linear model. Sparsity is often connected to the Oracle property. We point out that this latter property is highly misleading and should not be relied upon when judging the performance of an estimator. The observations are not new, but worth recalling. Hodge's construction of an estimator exhibiting a deceiving pointwise asymptotic behavior, i.e. the Oracle property in today's parlance, has led mathematical statisticians to realize the importance uniformity has to play in asymptotic statistical results. It is thus remarkable today, more than 50 years later, we observe a return to Hodge's estimator under the guise of newly proposed estimators. What is even more surprising is the deceiving pointwise asymptotic properties of these estimators, i.e. the Oracle property, is now being advertised as virtues of these methods. It is therefore perhaps fitting to repeat Hayek's warning, especially misinformative can be limit results that are not uniform. Then the limit may exhibit some features that are not even approximately true for any finite n. And then they have this other paper that is almost unreadable in 2005, but if you really wanna get into it, um, is more generally about this idea of, we do model selection, and if those are consistent, kind of what happens and what this does for risk, What's kind of the punchline? Well, they're saying, wait, hold on. Obviously the Oracle property is kind of a crappy property to be focused on because the problem with it is that it's point wise. It's conceptually saying, look, imagine there's a truth. Lasso converges to it point wise. It doesn't say anything about uniformity, un uniformity in the convergence. And more generally it doesn't, it says basically you, the inference and in these post-selection methods is bad the ability to select elements can be misleading. And in some ways, what you can think about is that, you know, think about what's happening is that there's basically, because of this thresholding, right? You think about things wanting to be pushed to zero, things bounce around very quickly as you include and exclude elements from the regression set, right? So you imagine I go from a world where I include something to not, all of a sudden I'm going to get 
weird properties if they're correlated or if I'm going to, if, you know, it's actually not part of the true set. There's just going to get lots of movement very, very quickly in an in a indiscreet way or non-discreet way. So just to give you an example um, of what Hodge's estimator is, um, I'll just kind of show you what it looks like now. So I have some typos here. I'm sorry. So I wanted you to sort of know um, what the Hodge's estimator is because it's such a stark example that makes it really clear what the problem is with Lasso, which is, um, you know, consider some estimator theta, um, theta hat sub n for some um, estimate theta. And then what you can do is you have some estimator. And now what you say is I'm going to make a, an additional form of it that's called Hodge's estimator, which is the same estimator if the estimator is above some value. So here, if it's above, you know, one over n to the one fourth, so above some threshold, it'll be equal to theta hat. And below some threshold, it'll be equal to zero identically. So there's some ring right around zero that you're going to set, you're going to basically shrink everything to zero. And it's like a quasi shrunk estimator, right? It's just basically this like bang, bang thing where you just drop everything to zero. Sounds kind of familiar, right? It sounds a little bit like Lasso. This is what's called like a super efficient estimator. It's, it converges really, really fast in cases when theta is zero, right? It convert because it's all, it's just basically equal to zero at all points. And so it's already exactly equal. If the true thing is zero, it converges immediately. And everywhere else, it converges to a normal distribution because the kind of the threshold moves, right? But the problem is, is the convergence isn't, isn't uniform. So the convergence basically, um, as you can imagine, right, the convergence kind of is, depends on where you are, what the true value of the theta is. And the closer it is to zero, it kind of creates this thresholding time. And so what you can do is you can write down the mean squared error for different samples, depending on what the true value of theta is. And what it does is as you get closer and closer, the lines here, this is just from Wikipedia, but it comes from Vandervart, if you're interested from the asymptotic statistics book. Um, the blue line here is for a sample of five. The purple line is for a sample of 50. And then all of is a sample of 500. And as it moves, you get weirder and weirder behavior close to zero. So it's basically what this is going to say is that this estimator has horrible properties when you're epsilon close to zero, amazing properties at zero. And then it's kind of normal as you get further away from it. And that, that's problematic because really the idea here is that if you let n go to infinity, you can get arbitrarily close to infinite risk or infinite mean squared error. So that's, that's, this is kind of the canonical example from 50 years ago that they're referring to, or now 60, that they're referring to that was used to kind of point out these properties. This is a great thing to talk about at parties. Once we have parties again, people will love this. Just bring this up. They'll be like, this is super interesting. Um, so anyway, this is a really interesting um, example, kind of highlights this point. And again, to Daniel's idea is that uh, this is really focusing on the estimator rather than any sort of prediction problem per se that you're trying to do. Okay. Uh, another fact that I wanted to say simply because I think it's really interesting and it's not something that comes across well to me in, in doing this. Um, and I'll come back to it hopefully in other lectures, but one thing that really kind of lasso, lasso convergence results that like more generally these Oracle properties and these ideas that lasso does a good job. A lot of these properties about lasso really only hold under this important condition called irrepresentability. So this is a super like, sounds really very cool, but it's not that interesting. Really what it's conceptually saying is that if you have highly collinear regressors, Lasso can do actually not very well. And the reason for this is that, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna like be able to explain it with my hands super well, but the idea is that, you know, if, imagine there are things that should be excluded from the regression, from the true regression, but they're correlated with ones that should be included. The problem is, is Lasso is really going to struggle to know not to pick the irrelevant co covariate because that um, irrelevant covariant can be can basically be representing the relevant covariates. This is basically some linear combination where it can cause an issue, and that causes issue. I mean, it's just like challenging for it's, there's no way for Lasso to know, and so the more correlation there is, the bigger the problem. And so there are conditions about what it needs to be, 
but more generally, and I, I know that there's some folks in class who have done some of this work, um, Lasso just does a much better job when things are orthogonal to one another. Orthonormal or orthogonal regressors are much better off and um, they won't have this issue in the same way. Um, this problem is extremely solvable. Like if you don't care about the coefficients per se and you're just predicting, you can just orthogonalize the covariates manually, right? That's, that's like, everyone here should know how to do that. You just plug them in, you can just kind of um, convert them into a PCA basis, for example, and then just run all the, P all the PCA components. Um, I guess I said that everyone should know how to do it. And then I was like, oh, how do you do that? So it's not that obvious, but it's, do it's not that hard either. Um, there are ways to basically orthogonalize all your right-hand side variables. Um, the problem is that this kind of defeats the whole interpretability point, right? Like, okay, we're going to do, we're going to like put these things in and we want to pick the right ones. And then I'm going to convert them into these things that have no interpretability. So I think the thing that I really wanted to tell you guys about, because I think this is going to show up in asset pricing and other settings, like Leland, I think you might find this interesting. This is actually a fixable problem. So there's this paper by Gia and Rohe from 2015 on something called the puffer transformation, which is basically the key insight is the following, which says, look, take some matrix F. Given a matrix F, you can pre-multiply your regression. So I'm doing this in vector notation. So this is just an N by one matrix. Where now, instead of Y equals X beta, I have FY equals FX beta, right? It's just some transformation. I'm just like this, the simplest example in OLS world that we, where we learn this um, in intro econometrics, right? It's like when you do GLS and you rescale everything, right? There's some variance estimate and you rescale your estimators. That's not what you want to do here, but this transformation is what's called a preconditioning matrix, is what they call it. And what's neat is you can run FY on FX using Lasso. And basically, if you do it F with this particular thing called the puffer transformation, where you use U D inverse U prime, where the U and D come, this, come from the singular value decomposition of X, that you'll basically get the estimates of beta and it's the same beta that you wanted in your original regression without this irrepresentability. It guarantees irrepresentability, but you still get the betas back, which means we don't have to do this orthogonalization, um, which is really cool. I mean, this is like a very compelling thing. Um, I'm not gonna be able to talk about it today given time, but there are reasons why this could be interesting. Like if you're thinking about selection of treatments, for example, where there is correlation and you are, you don't want to orthogonalize because there's meaningful interpretation of what's going on, you can do puffer to get the actual coefficients back and still be able to talk about the underlying covariates. The key downside here is remember this F still multiplies the epsilons and so it can increase the variance of the estimators. And so there's a price to pay, um, nothing's free, right? Uh, what you can do though, and what they talk about in the paper is there are ways to kind of optimally trade off on this, right? So you can kind of be like, okay, how do I still do this, but not increase my variance too much? This is a very, I think this is a very cool paper. So this is a picture from it. This is why they call it puffer. Um, so this is a three-dimensional version of that lasso picture that we had. So remember how lasso we had, so just so that everybody remembers, we had this picture, right? This is a picture on the left. This is just that picture but in three dimensions. So now we have three covariates. We have the X and A is the one we're pre-puffer. And because one of the covariates is highly, highly um, correlated, it's not a sphere, right? So the X is, if they were, if they were uncorrelated, it'd be a sphere. They'd be, cause these are, there's basically like, nor if they're normal or anything where they're uncorrelated um, and have the same variance, homoscedastic, then now they're correlated and what it does is it, it stretches them up in this way. And so there's this problem in that the lasso is not able to figure out that one of these should be zero because of the stretching of this. There's a lot of places in which it touches. Basically, it fa this fails a representability and as a consequence, you've got, you can't, lasso doesn't work well. Well, in panel B, what it does is it converts the X matrix using this puffer transformation and it converts it back into this basis where it's a sphere and it 
as a consequence, Lasso correctly picks it. It sets, it thresholds one of these down to zero, and then it's just this um, point in the middle. So this is why they call it puffer. It's not obvious it's the best name, but I guess they couldn't call it shrinkage because obviously that's taken. So it looks kind of like a puffer fish. And so I think that's why they picked it. But honestly, kind of interesting. And in, if you're in the space of thinking about lasso and you have this problem with irrepresentability or highly correlated covariates, this is really wor something worth thinking about because um, it can be quite interesting. Um, it's a way to kind of preserve the interpretability of the coefficient while still doing lasso um, and being able to do these things. Um, okay, so punchline for lasso. I think step one, remember asymptotics are approximations. Uniformity matters a lot. The thresholding criterion for lasso creates uh, weird behavior that can be unsmooth. So when I say, e.g., there's no free lunch or is there? And so this is, you know, when I'm loopy writing these at night, this is how excited I get about this. So the key point that kind of you get into here is that, and I think Daniel kind of raised this already, was saying, well, what this kind of complaint, especially this lieben Potter complaint, was about estimates of the parameters themselves. And if you care less about that, or if you're willing to assume a lot of sparsity in some meaningful ways, or both really is kind of the meaning, the point, then you can actually do really well. If you don't care about being wrong on a couple of things, you can actually do quite well in these settings. And so that's what we're going to talk about for this, um, for the remainder of the course, or for remainder of the class. So just some points about this. There are a ton of other types of linear regularization methods. We're going to talk about some of these other nonlinear ones later in the course. We're going to come back to this. This is just like other linear methods one could know. Ridge regression, elastic net, group lasso, fused lasso, adaptive lasso, bridge regression, Bayesian lasso, prior lasso. There's a lot of methods. Um, the key thing in the end is what I hope you kind of take from this is remember, these are all just versions of trying to shrink or deal with certain types of problems. And the idea is that they're trying to solve certain issues. Most of these are trying to deal with this issue of highly correlated regressors. So group lasso, for example, is trying to do that by allowing things um, to be correlated amongst themselves. Um, you know, there are a number of elements of this where it's doing this. I'm going to focus mainly when I'm talking about things is lasso. Um, but, you know, these different ML methods, it's really going to be a function of, um, I'm going to be talking about it as if it's lasso. Really kind of most of the stuff I'm talking about for the rest of the day is we have some ML method that does some kind of dimension reduction in order to do prediction. How well can we do? And it turns out the sparsity assumption with that, plus some additional um, one other term is actually very powerful. So what? So how does an applied economist actually use this? So that's a really, it's an important question. I think it's kind of unfortunately, and I don't want you to come away from this class of being like, awesome. I know how to do machine learning now. I'm going to do this everywhere. Um, please don't do that. I'm going to be really disappointed if that's the case. Really, you know, the key thing is that historically machine learning has been used for prediction and prediction is obviously super important for those of you who are interested in asset pricing kinds of questions. This is a good setting to kind of use these tools, um, especially because we have kind of like a high dimension set of things and we want to know what's most important. It's not kind of amazing for prediction is not the same thing as causal inference though. Um, Mullen, Nathan and Spice, uh, Spies, uh, Jan Spies have this, um, very nice JEP article if you're interested and in kind of they talk about more generally ML methods and talk about applications of this. So they talk about, you know, one place you can think about this prediction and why it might matter above and beyond just purely predicting something. But in an economics question is, well, what if they're decision problems and I want to contrast decision problems done by a computer or some sort of an algorithm um, such as like in bail decisions. So they have a very nice paper where they're looking at, um, bail decisions by judges. I kind of do some of this work in a paper thinking about credit lending and thinking about differences across race. Um, you can think about differences, uh, prediction and forecasting, so asset pricing. So Stefano uh, Giglio has this uh, paper about the factor zoo where they're kind of thinking about uh, ML methods and penal and specifically lasso and how you can use that to um, account for thinking about 
um, prediction and, and factor selection. Uh, you can use it to test a model or a predictor. So you can create kind of a, a benchmark, a theoretic model to test some prediction and then see how a model does relative to that. These are a number of things that kind of are cool statistical things that once you realize you can be very flexible and have the tools to estimate flexible statistical problems, you can do a lot of interesting economics, but they're not about like, I want to estimate the causal effect of X on Y, right? They need to be used in another context. So what we're going to talk about for the rest of today now is how lasso methods can be used in causal inference. So really the way to think about this is the relative merits of lasso versus the standard model is kind of the difference between y hat and beta hat. So this is not, I didn't think of this idea. This is Mullen, Nathan, and Spies. They basically, this is one of the ways that they encourage us. And I think this is not, they probably weren't the first ones who said this either. Really lasso or other ML methods is really good for constructing a prediction. Something that has a low MSC. You shouldn't necessarily trust the particular estimates of the underlying parameters in the model. And inference more generally is challenging on those because of these distributional problems that the Lieben and Pasher critique. So what, it's, what that means though is like, well, if they're good at prediction, i.e. if they're good at fitting things and getting values out of them, what if we thought about the problem of semi-parametric models and more generally this concept of nuisance parameters? It turns out lasso and ML methods more generally are really kind of useful solutions for these problems. And it's basically because like we have some function that we need to estimate. We need to have a prediction from this function. We don't care about the guts of it. Like we don't care about the parameters of the function per se. So let's throw this ML method at it and then get the other piece out of it instead. So just to put something concrete on this, um, consider the following like partially additive model. So um, we have some outcome yi, there's some treatment di, uh, where we're interested in some parameter tau, which is like the average treatment effect. And then there's some controls g of xy, xi plus some error term. For now, let's just talk about things as if di is exogenous. Um, you know, there's some excise we potentially want to control for in order to minimize noise. And then we have some function that we don't know. You could even make stuff simpler, right? You could just say, oh, let's just approximate things with some, there's some linear function. So the estimation of G0 or these betas are nuisance parameters, right? We'd like them to get a better estimate of tau, but we don't care about them per se. So a way, um, before we move on, a way to remember this in the context of like when we were thinking about random um, design-based inference. Remember when we talked about what design-based inference is doing? Well, it's saying, hey, let's predict values of yi0 and yi1 in order to impute the relative values and then let's weight them up. And so that's what this will effectively be trying to do, right? They'll be predicting the underlying values for given covariates so then we can get a more efficient estimate. It's soaking up variation in ui. Um, there are a lot of results in this space. Um, I have kind of an amazing, I'm just gonna show you the, I didn't really feel, I've been posting slides online. And so I didn't really feel comfortable putting this in the slides, but I want you guys to see this because I was really proud of it is, um, I'll just show you, I'm gonna zoom in so you can see. I was starting to do, Victor Chernozikov basically has written every paper in this topic, it feels like. I mean, if you guys don't know who he is, he's a econometrician at, MIT has done a lot of stuff, very, um, very well published guy. He writes a lot of papers. I think last night, the way that it was described to me is that he writes, he writes a paper and then rather than let other people write the follow up papers on it, he just writes every follow up paper on it as well. And so what I was going to do is I was going to then Photoshop him with all the co authors that are writing these ML papers. Um, so here he is, I didn't, I was like, this seems a little absurd. Uh, I, I, it feels a little silly. But anyway, here's him and then his various co-authors who include um, Belloni, uh, uh, Christian Hansen, and a number of other folks have worked a lot on this topic. Um, in any case, the point is, is he's had a, there's a lot of really interesting stuff in this space. I'm going to kind of do um, my best to describe it. 
Um, what I really want to touch on is a, I'm going to kind of just describe, I think what they view as the way to do this. Um, and two, I want, um, to kind of just touch on how they address the two things that I raised at the beginning part of the talk, which was a, there's this Lieben Pacher inference problem. And then, which we've alluded to the solution already. And then B is, well, there's this bias variance problem. How do you deal with that? Given that like, you, you know, you're going to put bias into your estimates already. We already talked about how these ML methods create bias in their estimates. How does that, how do you fix that problem? A lot of the insights that they have that are, we're going to talk about today carry over to IV. So they have like a ton of papers also thinking about how can you do this with IV and a lot of other settings. Um, just for the purposes of keeping things simple, we're focusing on just an exogenous treatment, um, but it's worth sort of knowing, and we'll try and touch on it again when we when we do IV, that this also carries over, many of these points carry over. So what the papers to kind of look at, there's these two papers by Chernozikov, Chedverikov, Demerier, Esther Duflo, Christian Hansen, Whitney Newey, and James Robbins. Um, this is why it's the Avengers, there's so many of them. Um, and they have some uh, very nice papers. In particular, the one to look at if you're interested is um, they have an AA P and P that's very nice. So this is from their forthcoming Econometrica, which is saying, well, why do we need ML if we have an RCT? So I'm keeping us in the space where we have an RCT. You may be in a space where you don't have an RCT, but for now it's kind of the most trivial version. And, and they say at first blush, these two sets of methods may seem to have very different applications. In the most basic randomized controlled experiment, there's a sample with a single treatment and a single outcome. Covariates are not necessary. And even linear regression is not the best way to analyze the data. Um, so this is Inman's and Rubin's textbook, but we talked about this, right? Like the inverse propensity weighted function, um, weighted estimator is probably the best way to do that if you have a really simple version of it. In practice, however, applied researchers are often confronted with more complex experiments, for example, there might be accidental imbalances in the data. So something goes wrong or the randomization kind of isn't as good as you would like. That you wanna require selecting on control variables in a principled way in order to balance the treatment in a meaningful way. ML tools such as the lasso method proposed in these papers or double machine learning method proposed in Chernozikov et al have proven useful for this purpose. And then they go on and you know, we'll talk about this other times. The other piece in which ML can be very useful is for subgroup analysis. So what if you have lots of treatment combinations that you're interested in? ML also provides a really nice disciplined way um, for looking at those subgroups. But that's not for today, simply because we don't have time for it. Also, I don't understand it yet. So we're going to get to it once by the end of the course, hopefully. Um, so what we're going to kind of do is... So just to give you some of the intellectual history, and then I'm we're just going to walk through one example because um, there's just a lot to digest. So intellectually, what happens is the following. So Chernozikov effectively comes into this field. Um, you maybe remember we talked about him doing this IV quantile stuff in the 2000s. The end of the 2000s, he basically starts writing papers on this lasso stuff. Um, and what's really interesting is that he has several papers that are really about this lasso problem. So thinking about um, post-model selection inference on parameters. And so, Daniel, to your question or to this idea of, hey, these things do a good job, Chernozikov basically writes two or three papers where they do this model selection and they do inference and they show uniform convergence. And they don't even really engage with these lasso property papers. They just sort of say, okay, let's assume sparsity, which is exactly the point that you said. They assume this like very strong sparsity, some orthogonality results. Um, and then they show that you can do inference in the post-selection world. And the reason for it is basically what they, they, um, they, the reason that it's sort of interesting is that their first couple of papers don't even refer to these Lieben Pacher papers. So it's pretty clear from the intellectual history of this that, you know, Victor's an econometrician. It's very common in econometrics to do uniform convergence of these estimators. You care a lot about uniform convergence. And as a consequence, they just sort of solve for when this would be true. And then basically like four papers in, he starts citing Lieb and Pacher, him and his various co-authors start 
citing um, Lieben Potter and obviously addressing this issue, which is the key points of it um, to, to get to this, this idea is that there's really this point that given this function G that this G function can be approximated reasonably well. So there's some linear function that approximates it and the piece that isn't approximated well, that that piece is orthogonal to any estimation that we care about. So it doesn't really cause additional problems. You can be wrong. So for example, there might be coefficients that get set to zero that shouldn't be set to zero, right? So imagine betas that get pinned to zero. You didn't actually mean for them to be pinned to zero. Well, those aren't gonna be very big. And so they don't create a lot of misspecification error anyway. And so as a consequence, those all kind of die out in the limit and you have a reasonably small number of things anyway. And so what ends up happening is that these two conditions together really help you pin down and get be able to do inference um, in the right way with subject to the very important caveat that you can't assume that these models are selecting the right coefficients in the same way. So there's other assumptions that you can do to get this kind of convergence, but the inference is sort of, is sort of different in that sense. Um, So the two things is there's a sparsity point. Um, and the second thing that they really emphasize, oh, so just to kind of continue the, the intellectual history is there's this point, they start citing this and effectively what they build up to is kind of this idea of, let's imagine we live in a world where we have this type of estimation. We potentially even have IV. We want to be able to use ML to estimate these nuisance parameters such that we can get access to these finite dimensional parameters. What can we do? And um, they basically had this paper about uh, what they call double debiased machine learning um, in econometric theory in 2018 that outlines uh, the approach. And so the key two ingredients are the ones I talked about, sparsity and then sample splitting, which is this idea of accounting for this overfitting bias from using these ML methods. And so the idea is to say, splitting the sample to do your, your lasso or your ML in one thing, and then using the other part of the sample to estimate the parameter that you're interested in. And this helps avoid some of the underlying bias. So I'm gonna walk you through basically what they do in this. And then I think um, I'm going to try and update the notes a little bit more. I didn't get as far as I would have liked just to have some more stuff on this. I'm, I'm probably going to throw you guys into this for the homework, at least a very simple version of this. Um, but I will update the notes a little bit in order to make that make this clearer. But let me just kind of highlight what this approach is, is trying to do. So conceptually, remember that what we're trying to do is we have a, a function G, which we're trying to estimate such that we can do a better job of estimating tau. They're just assume that they're mean zero. So demeaning them um, ex ante. So this is why we don't have to carry around averages when we're doing this. There's a naive approach where one could do, which what you do is you say, all right, split the sample in half, estimate G zero using one half of the sample, and then use that estimated G zero in the other half to construct this tau estimate, right? So what it is here is that this is the variance of D, right? So this is mean zero, excuse me. So the, um, this is the variance. Um, and this is the covariance between D and the residualized component of YI, right? So what happens here? So this is that same thing on the top. Well, so what happens in this setting is that if D is an RCT, you don't have any problems. So if it's basically totally random, so if, if X doesn't predict D in any meaningful way, then you're fine. And the reason for that is what your estimator looks like is that you can rewrite the asymptotic, sort of the, the CLT version of it is root N tau hat minus tau. And what we're gonna assume is imagine that DI is this function of X and VI. So the, the good case of the world is when M is zero identically and it's everything is just VI and it's sort of just randomly assigned. In that case, all you have is this first term, which is this, this normal piece. You have the, the variance of DI in the bottom, and then you have that DI is orthogonal to UI and you're done. In 
And then the second term, so, but then if you don't have that, what can happen is, is that this second term here, which comes from the G, this comes from this estimation problem, is that you have an estimate of G zero minus um, G hat zero. So this is basically, this is the part where you're trying to approximately estimate it. But the problem is that if DI is a function of XI, then these are gonna be correlated. It's basically saying like, you haven't adjusted for the fact, you haven't residualized D. So remember when we did for schwa, what you can, when we do for schwa, actually this is probably the best way I should have said this. When we do for schwa, remember this, this, this idea that we have something like Y equals DI tau plus XI beta epsilon. And I told you there's some matrix M and what you can do is you can write M, M, D, tau plus M epsilon. And after the residualization, you can estimate, you can just run this linear regression, right? Do you remember that from Frischois? Yeah. So if you, in this prom, process, basically this is all coming down to this M and D. If D is perfectly randomly assigned, M, and that means D is uncorrelated with X. And as a consequence, um, MD equals D. So the residualization of D with respect to X has no impact because they're perfectly uncorrelated with one another. Right? That make, hopefully makes sense to you guys. So what would happen is that this would turn into just MY equals D tau plus M epsilon. And you would have just hopefully reduced the variance of epsilon somewhat. Anyway. That's what would happen here. But if instead what you do is run this, re this regression and you don't residualize um, D with respect to X and D is correlated with X, then that's gonna get you a different parameter. It's gonna be biased. And that's basically what, this is just the nonlinear complicated version of exactly that statement. Is the idea that I did for schwa, but I only did it on the outcome variable and not on my right-hand variable of interest. So, like I said, in a correctly specified RCT, this shouldn't matter. However, in finite samples or with issues with controls, this could create poor performance. So it could unbalance the treatment. Um, in fact, Beloni, Chernozikov, and Hansen have this restud paper where you can actually use lasso to directly include um, relevant controls. Um, they basically do the following. They're saying, I want to, um, people are running regressions where they're saying, I want to look at the effect of state laws on these outcomes. And people put in a bunch of controls to kind of validate you know, their assumption. They say, we control for a host of variables and that's that makes it work and they say oh well let's be disciplined about it in order to kind of choose the ones that are most important frankly both are kind of bad for causal inference in the sense that you don't really have an identification strategy you just have a i want to look at this law and i want to control for stuff for example you could easily condition on colliders by accident um and that would cause serious issues for your um causal inference but uh more generally in an RCT setting where something happens or you need to condition on some things in order to fix balance, you can do this and it will actually fix it well. So what might happen, for example, is that D might be correlated with some of your baseline characteristics. For example, sometimes you run an RCT and it, it's not balanced. I'm speaking from experience. So you wanna kind of try and balance it in order to get more efficient estimates. Just to give you an example, actually. So we ran an experiment with Facebook where we were trying to encourage better behavior during COVID. And we ran, it's literally randomized. We randomized it across counties in the United States on Facebook. But the problem is, is that there's some things that were not balanced ex post in this. And so we'd like to condition on those to at least deal with the finite sample and balance between these. And what this approach would let us do is to say, okay, well, D seems to be correlated in finite samples with this. Let's do this approach to adjust for those differences across the groups. Um, so in this case, what they suggest is, well, what's the solution? So they, it's a double lasso. 
In this setting, what you do is you basically do a first wall style orthogonalization. You have to estimate M or remember M. We have a lot of notation floating around now. I'm sorry. M is kind of the, it's basically like the P score. So um, I didn't say that uh, D had to be binary, but if it was, this would be the P score. And then what you do is you estimate V hat, which is DI minus the M hat XI. And then what you construct is you'd construct the version of tau, which is using the residualized component. You'd basically be instrumenting for D using this V hat, and then you'd be instrumenting with this V on the residual component. What are the three pieces to this estimator in the limiting distribution? There's the standard thing, which is the good part. This is the normally distributed thing that has very nice properties, is uniform, et cetera. There's a second piece, which is regularization bias. We're basically going to assume it's small through these sparsity conditions that um, Daniel raised earlier. And then the final point is this remainder term, which really has to do with kind of how well behaved the data is assumed to be, the data generating process. And the way that Chernozikov and, and co-authors suggest getting around it is to effectively, um, oh, weird, is effectively to um, split the sample. So do this sample splitting that I suggested before. So that's kind of the, the three pieces of it. The, what, they're, what they're really doing is just to make it clear is that the intuition is that you have to do this kind of first wall style orthogonalization or what they call Neiman orthogonalization. That effectively gets you it so you don't have this bias term floating around. Then you need to make two additional assumptions. One is regularization, which is the sparsity point. And then the second is dealing with how the data is distributed, that's sample splitting. Once you have those, you actually are in pretty good shape. You effectively get uniform convergence. And the reason is it's not about nailing down every piece of G or M. So those are not assumed necessarily. They don't have to perfectly be estimated. Um, but instead, what you care about is nailing down and doing inference on the tau. And so uniformity in tau is assumed by having basically the estimation error in G and M be orthogonal to the moments that are relevant for estimating theta. And this is really untestable. I mean, sparsity is not a testable assumption, right? We don't know what the true underlying distribution is, um, but it's, a, it's not that unreasonable in a lot of settings. Um, they really emphasize this sample splitting point. What you really do in, in spirit or actually in practice is you can, if you're familiar with ML methods more generally is you split it lots of ways. And then you, what you do is you estimate it in a bunch of them and then you average over them so that you get, you have smaller samples, but then you're able to take an average and that'll get you a more effective estimate. So in steps, what are you gonna do? The algorithm is as follows. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna flesh this out a little bit from their ARPMP, because I wanna basically give you an example of if you had a treatment that you wanted to do, what would you do? But it's effectively split the sample into K pieces in each split sample, use the, so say it was 10 pieces, use the other one, uh, nine tenths of the data to estimate the nuisance parameters using ML, use that estimate of it to estimate within the one tenth, the treatment effect, get that parameter of interest, do that 10 times, then average the 10 of them together. And that has a well-defined asymptotic distribution that you can um, talk about as a standard normal. You can talk about confidence intervals around it. It's very well behaved in, in standard ways. What's, Notable about this, hopefully this doesn't seem like too much like magic. Um, I sort of, once you kind of get the hang of this, you can just do this in your own papers. So I'm doing this in my papers now. It's like, if you're comfortable, if you were going to throw controls into your regression anyway, why not do it this way, right? So you don't know what controls to put in. So we're here, right? We have some covariate. We're claiming D is conditionally exogenous anyway. So for example, what this... What this method does let you do, and you can you can allow for this, is you could say there's yi, there's di, there's some control I have to condition on, and then there are other controls I might want to condition on for purposes of worrying about bias or for purposes of efficiency. What this method lets you do is you can in insist that the ones that need to be conditioned on are in there. You can then use ML to pick the other ones. And you get basically a well-defined estimator of exactly um, the parameter of interest. So 
I'm going to like try and clean this up a little bit, but I, I really think the main thing I want you to take away from this is I, I think it's worth engaging with this because in so many settings, we just toss controls in anyway to kind of show what's going on and show things are valid. Why not use this as a method for kind of in a disciplined way that's driven by the data, pick what our controls are to get the most efficient estimator. Now it becomes more complicated in all the types of identification settings we're gonna discuss like RD and other things, this is maybe less well-defined, um, but hopefully you know, there are ways to kind of pivot the problem to saying, hey, we have nuisance parameters, we need to estimate those. Then using those estimates of those, we can estimate some interesting finite sample parameter. Um, that's all I got. Um, let me know if you have any questions. I know this is not easy stuff and I will try and clean this up a little bit, but any questions?